rookie Pete Myers was having to live down an embarrassment of a different kind to his teammates, with the Bulls leading 118-109 to late in their win versus New Jersey. Myers was sent to the line after a foul. Also on the line was free Pizza Hut pizza for the fans <laughs> if the Bulls win and score 120 points. Myers made it only one of two, leaving the faithful going home hungry. <laughs> Myers said that he thought that people were applauding MJ. It was actually people yelling at him that free pizza was coming if he hit both <laughs> foul shots. <laughs> That's fantastic. I always like to say that Michael got to play with me for a year at North Carolina. <laughs> I think it really helped him. Spectacular player from the beginning. You can see right away Jordan was going to be a big-time scorer. And showed what an impact he was going to have on the league. This is NB87, celebrating the 30-year anniversary of Michael Jordan's Chicago Bulls in the 1987 NBA season. Now here's your hosts, Adam Ryan and Aaron Steen. Welcome back to another episode of NB87, up to episode six in our series, Aaron. Hello, mate. Thanks again for joining me, and uh, how are you today? Really good, mate. If you're new to the show, welcome. Regular listeners, welcome back. NBA News, Notes and Quotes, December 31st, 1986, through January 14th, 1987. New Year's Eve of 1986. There were no games on that date, so let's move straight to January of 1987. On the first, the Bulls started the new year with a new name. Friend of the show, said Al Threat. <laughs> and if you go to inallairness.com forward slash 12, you can hear Adam's very interesting conversation with the aforementioned. <laughs> Threat joined the Bulls in exchange for Buffon Coulter and a future second round pick who would become household name Stanley Brundy. Hmm. Or Brundy. Apologies to Stanley if you're listening. Stanley would play 128 minutes in 16 games with New Jersey in the 89-90 season. Love that sort of stuff, mate. That's awesome. The Bulls are hoping that Threet will add some offensive power after Coulter's shooting struggles in his short stay in Chicago. Threet was hoping for an opportunity to play that he didn't get behind Julius Irving, Andrew Tony, and newly acquired World B Free in Philadelphia. Jerry Krause claimed he has been pursuing Threet since he became Bulls GM. Doug Collins compared Threet's off-the-bench scoring mentality to Vinnie Johnson and liked that he could play either guard spot. Yeah, he was an important player and was very productive. Mm. So good to see that uh, Sadal had an opportunity to try and establish his uh, career once again uh, with the Bulls. Now, on New Year's Day of 1987, there was just one NBA game. It was a disastrous one for Trailblazers fans. Uh, those that remained inside Memorial Coliseum witnessed the visiting LA Lakers demolish Portland 140 to 104, and that ended a 12 game home win streak. And said Blazers coach Mike Shula post game, quote, they rammed it down our throats. They literally did anything they wanted to do. Wow. End quote. <laughs> so quite a disturbing way to cl close out a, a terrible loss there for the Blazers. <laughs> On January 2nd, 71 points and 29 rebounds. No, those aren't Wilt's averages from 1962. It's the combined <laughs> averages of the Celtics front line of Bird, Parrish and McHale in this 86-87 season. This includes career highs of 26 and 11 from Kevin McAngel. Kevin McAngel, great throwback to NB85. Yeah. That Celtics front line, mate, unbelievable. We're talking about January 2 here. We'll get to Chicago's game at Boston soon. Uh, there were actually 10 games on this date. The Lakers' dominance continued as they spanked the visiting Phoenix Suns 155-118. to And quoting from the Arizona Republic, The most exciting moment for the crowd of 17,505 came with 4.41 to go when Suns guard Grant Gondrasic, hope I pronounced that right, and Lakers forward Frank Bukowski got into a scuffle under the Lakers' basket near the Suns' bench. Wes Matthews of the Lakers joined in. Suns assistant coach El Bianchi stepped in trying to break it up. Matthews took a swing at him. Bianchi was restrained by William Bedford as Matthews was pulled away. And Bianchi said, no harm, no foul. Quote, are you kidding? That pygmy, I'm fine. End quote. So that was an interesting comment there. Where's Matthews? Jeez, he took a swing at him. I'm sure that if he had it connected that he would have put Al on his Bianchi. <laughs> he, he would have too. For what it's worth, Gondrasic, Brakowski and Matthews were ejected. But yeah, quite interesting that uh, assistant coaches were actually getting into it there. So hmm. 
Now, Chicago at Boston in front of 14,890 saw the Celtics win 113 to 99. Chicago dropped to 14 and 15 on the year. Uh, they trailed by as much as 25 points in the second half of this game. For the Bulls, though, Jordan had 34 points and 8 rebounds. Charles Oakley, 16 points and 13 boards. And Brad Sellers had a good game, 14 points, 6 rebounds and 3 steals. For Boston, Bird was almighty with 37 points, 8 rebounds and 9 assists. Kevin McHale, 29 points and 9 rebounds. And Parrish and Ainge added 15 points each. Larry Bird agreed that the smaller Bulls were at a disadvantage with their 15 to 18 foot jump shots compared to the Celtics layups from two feet. Makes sense. <laughs> it does. That said, a little lineup of a Sellers, Oakley, Jordan, Paxson and Threat went on a 16 4 run to cut the Boston lead to eight with seven minutes remaining in the game. Rookie Sellers provided some inside presence with his best game of the season and declared himself a man possessed in 1987 after his four-day suspension late in 1986. Good stuff there from Brad. On the 3rd of January, Chicago hosted Detroit in front of 15,413 at Chicago Stadium, and the Bulls had a 124-119 to victory. They moved back to 500 on the season at 15-15, and and that snapped Detroit's four-game win streak. For Chicago, Jordan was a man possessed, speaking of. 47 points. Brad Sellers, the aforementioned as well, had 27 points in a stellar effort from him, or a stellar effort from him, in 39 <laughs> minutes. And Charles Oakley had a great game with 16 points and 18 rebounds. For Detroit, Isaiah was unconscious as well. He had 36 points and 13 assists. Adrian Dantley, 22 points. And Sidney Green, 17 points and 8 rebounds. So some tremendous stat lines all around. Now, this was the 17th time that Jordan had reached or surpassed 40 points in a game for the season. It was the 14th such time in his previous 19 appearances. Incredible stuff. And for Brad Sellers, his career high would be 32 points in a late November game of 1988 at Golden State. But what a great effort there from Brad as well to uh, step up, especially on the back of declaring himself a man possessed. Bob Sakamoto asked the question, when was the last time a Bulls seven-footer shot 12 for 14 from the field and finished the game with 27 points, 12 rebounds, and was a force in the middle? Probably never. These were the stats for rookie Brad Sellers in his first start at centre for the Bulls. He matched up during the game against Bill Lambier and John Sally of the Pistons, and Doug Collins planned to start him against the Cavs and rookie centre Bradley Lee Doherty in their upcoming game. Chicago led 37-25 to after one in their highest scoring quarter of the season, and 92-80 after three, behind 14 third-term points from Brad Sellers. MJ repeatedly answered with scores in the fourth when the Pistons got to within three points. Tremendous effort there from the Bulls to take the victory. January 4. Phoenix at Golden State were paced by Alvin Adams's would-be season high of 25 points in the 104-101 to win. This was the Oklahoma Kids' second last NBA season. Some might refer to Cleveland as, and I quote, the mistake by the lake, hmm. end quote. It is home for Brad Sellers and Charles Oakley, wrote Bob Sakamoto. The two will be giving out as many as 50 tickets to family and friends to attend the Bulls game in Cleveland. Of the three high school meetings between the teenage Oak and Sellers, Oakley won two as they played all three games matched up directly on each other. How good's that? Sellers said Oakley crushed him and he couldn't do anything with him. <laughs> <laughs> Pre-game Oakley also recounted his line from the previous year that his hometown Cavs would regret trading him at, at the draft, and if he had anything to do with it, the Cavs would never beat the Bulls. I love how Oakley just always said whatever he felt. That's a great little tidbit there about the fact that Oak and Sellers played against each other during high school. Yeah, in Cleveland, yeah. Good find, mate. I love that. In other news, Michael Jordan was being considered for a major role in a movie based on Rick Talander's book, Heaven is a Playground. And Gene Banks was drawing trade interest from teams such as the Knickerbockers, the Bucks, the Nuggets, and the Los Angeles Lakers. Okay, I didn't even know Gene was an artist. There you go. Chicago at Cleveland on January 6th in front of 12,151 fans saw the Bulls hold on for another victory, 99 to 95. They improved to 16 and 15 on the year. And for the Bulls, Jordan had 27 points. Just the fifth time this season he was held to under 30. Oakley had another great game, 15 points and 18 boards. Johnny Pax, 13 points. Earl the Twirl Curitan and Dave Corzine added 10 points each. Now for Cleveland, Ronnie Harper had 22 points. 
Brad Doherty out of Black Mountain, 15 points and 8 rebounds. Phil Hubbard, Mal Turpin and John Bagley all had 10 plus points apiece. The Bulls unleashed a Motta era style down and dirty defense on the Cavs in the Bulls win. John Paxson called it, and I quote, a Dave Corzine type game, end quote, <laughs> in reference to Corzine sacrificing his body for the team on a regular basis. Cleveland hit just one of its last 16 shots and went four for 21 overall in the last quarter. In a four point loss, that is brutal. After imploring his team to not leave the scoring load to MJ, Paxson hit two key jumpers down the stretch, including the game sealer. As the team with the NBA's third best defense, Chicago was now 10 and 3 in games in which they keep their opponent below 100 points. That's a fantastic stat too. Good stuff, mate. On January 8th in the Tribune, more Sakamoto gold with a headline, Bulls know they can count on banks. <laughs> Oh, that's fantastic stuff. Detailing the Gene Banks trade rumours and the impact that it was having on one of the more popular players on this tight-knit bull squad. In a 103-93 to loss to Cleveland, the LA Clippers dropped their 14th straight game. Worse yet, it was the 26th loss in 27 games, and they were a paltry 4-29. and uh, Same date, January 8th here. Chicago welcomed Portland in front of just 11,033 fans, to see the Bulls hold on for another victory. Four-point win, 121-117, to 117, and they improved to 17-15 and 15 on the year. Jordan was unbelievable in this game. He had a 53-point effort on 20 of 34 from the field and also had four boards, five assists, three steals, and two blocks. Charles Oakley, 16 points and 16 boards, and Brad Sellers, who was in fine form at this stage, 15 points and 10 rebounds. For Portland, Kiki Vandeweghe had an absolute blinder, 35 points, Clyde Drexler 23, and Steve Johnson 22 points and 13 rebounds. Every time I say a person's name and their first name is Steve, I always feel inclined to say Steve Swinger Johnson. Hello to Steve Sapanovich if you're listening. Mm. Understandable. When Michael is this good, he's in a world all his own, wrote Bob Sakamoto. The whole package was there. The hang time, the explosive first step, the soft jumper, and the Bulls' third straight win. Jordan said he felt like any shot that went up was going in, including a baseline spin on Drexler, avoiding the Jim Paxson double team that ended up in an up-and-under layup on the opposite side of the hoop to avoid two Blazers defenders who went sailing past him. Hmm. Now, I immediately pulled up this move on YouTube, and my description does not do it justice. You can easily find this one on YouTube, so it's definitely worth checking out. And I'll put a link to it in the show notes for what it's worth as well. You can check those out at inallairness.com slash nb87-6. The Bulls were down 13 in the second term when Coach Collins lost his cool at his team. The message was received loud and clear, and Jordan's teammates come into their own with some great performances from Oakley, Sellers, Paxson, and Turner. Collins called it the best game of the season for Jordan, who played, and I quote, like he was possessed. Lots of people are possessed in this <laughs> in this episode. Hello to Brad Sellers, if you're listening. <laughs> Indeed. The only down note from the game was a broken finger for reserve friend of the show, Sadale Threat, who would be out for up to six weeks. It was reported the following day. The Bulls would sign guard Fred Cofield to a 10-day contract to replace him, and Coach Collins indicated that sixth-round pick Air Petey, Pete Myers, would enter the Bulls' guard <laughs> rotation. Just love this sort of minutiae, mate, how we can find these sort of things happening and changes in the roster that are taking place due to injuries and whatnot. Can't get enough of this sort of stuff. Back to other games that took place on the 8th. Utah snapped the Lakers' eight-game win streak with a 107-101 to home victory that moved the Jazz to an impressive 20-12, and dropping the Lakers to 26-7 and on the year. And on January 9, of the seven games played on this date, the individual leading scorer was the Mavericks' Mark Aguirre, who registered 33 points to lead all scorers on games of that date. On the 10th of January, a great tidbit gleamed from the uh, Detroit Free Press. Jordan selected an all-defensive team that he'd have the most trouble playing against for an article. Now, interestingly, he did not name a single player from Detroit. Instead, his TV guide selections were Michael Cooper of the Lakers, T.R. Dunn of Denver, Alvin Robertson of San Antonio, Dennis Johnson of Boston, and Mike McGee of Atlanta. Wow. An interesting mixture of names there. Of course, they're all names that have been floated before about being tough defenders of Jordan, but for a Detroit Free Press article, no Pistons got any love, so Jordan was freezing them out, mate, for a change. 
I'm not sure on his career highs against each of these teams in which these guys were actually playing in the game against MJ, but I know that he, of course, dropped 63 on DJ and, and the Celtics, so all in context, I guess. Indeed. Same day, January 10, Chicago hosted New Jersey. A good crowd, 16,243. Saw the Bulls have another victory, 119 to 109, and moved to 18 and 15. This was the first of just two four-game win streaks that the team would enjoy all season. So for Chicago, Jordan had 31 points, seven boards and five assists. Charles Oakley had another great game, 21 points, nine rebounds and six assists. Brad Sellers, 20 points, 13 boards and three blocks. So he was absolutely on fire. And Johnny Paxson had 17 points and 10 assists, so a great double-double. For New Jersey, Buck Williams, 23 points and 10 boards. Orlando Woolridge, ex-Chicago Bull, 22 points. Uh, ben Coleman, 15 points. And Albert King, 11. No Bull. The Bulls are playing their best basketball of the season, wrote the sack. They won their fourth straight without MJ seemingly dominating the game, as his teammates shone bright and an astounding 27 assists on 30 made baskets in the first half alone as a team. Wow, that's unbelievable. That's an amazing stat. This included a team record tying 16 assists in the first quarter alone as they led by 14 at the half and 20 after three quarters. A 25 to 7 New Jersey run had the game back to 114 to 109 with a half minute remaining, but the work had been done by that stage. Dave Corzine said they could have played with anyone in the NBA in the first 42 minutes of the game, such was their ball movement. MJ said he enjoyed this win more than his 53 against Portland because it was less work for him. Oh, well, that makes sense. Former Bull Orlando Woolridge was met with boos oh. every time he touched the ball on his first game back in Chicago. It's unfortunate that he actually was getting booed by the fans because he was a really great player for the Bulls in his uh, duration there in Chicago. I agree. I liked him before we started recording NB85. Mm-hmm. I loved him after we finished that season, especially taking the time out to watch a few of his games. He was a magnificent player to watch. Yeah, definitely. It was reported in the game recap that GM Jerry Krause has a week to respond to a trade deal from the New York Knicks that would send Geno Banks to New York in exchange for Rory Sparrow and Lewis Orr. Okay. I had no idea that was the case. I remember Sparrow's name being floated. (laughs) I didn't mean that. Um, Sparrow and floating. Um, yeah, I remember his name being floated at one stage about possible trades, but Lewis Orr, no, no, no idea about that. That would have been interesting. Had he actually uh, ended up in New York? Hmm. Would have been good on Wall Street, Gene Banks. Speaking of Lewis Orr, probably my favorite highlight from his career is the dunk that the gentleman that I'm about to mention did on Lewis Orr that put him into the, the basket stanchion in Atlanta because on January 12, on Dominique Wilkins' 27th birthday, Bob Sakamoto explained three of the main reasons for the Bulls' four-game win streak. The Bulls' fast starts and the emergence of Bradley Don Sellers and the resurgence of <laughs> Charles Oakley. <laughs> Your penchant for yes. using middle names is absolutely fantastic. Collins also applauded the attitudes of the bench guys, such as Waiters, Myers and Brown, who were sacrificing playing time for the betterment of the team. On his 27th birthday, future LA Clipper Nick also celebrated <laughs> by dropping 53 of the best on the LA Clippers. That output was in Atlanta's 125 to 115 home win and bending the Clips to 4 and 31 on the year. In the day's only other game, Moses Malone was a beast, collecting 41 points and 20 rebounds. Wow. Leading his Washington Bullets to a 113 to 109 win over the Kings of Sacramento. In our chats with friend of the show, Todd Spear, during the week. <laughs> G'day, Todd. I mentioned that Horace Grant's 30-20 game uh, against Indiana in 92-93. Any game, I think, that a player has 30 or more points but can also match it up with 20 rebounds, it's a monster game. It is a monster. It is, and Moses had 41 it was, and 20. On January 13, 11 Bulls were on hand at the multiplex for the team's optional practice showing the hunger of the team who had won four in a row for the first time in almost two years. Even Sedale three with a broken finger was working out. Hmm. The only two guys who weren't there were Dave Corzine, who was attending to some personal business downtown, and Jordan, who flew home to North Carolina to visit his sick grandparents. Hmm. And if anyone feels the need to criticise Corzine for this, 
they'll have the Dave Corzine fan club to deal with. <laughs> Which we're both founding members of. Yes. Uh, love Big Dave. Threat said he didn't miss Philadelphia, who traded him on December 31 and was getting acclimated to his new home, Chicago, with the help of Charles Oakley. Apparently, one of the hottest players in the NBA is Gene Riverbanks. He was also drawing interest from San Antonio, who had traded him to the Bulls just two years earlier. Rookie Pete Myers was having to live down an embarrassment of a different kind to his teammates, with the Bulls leading 118-109 to late in their win versus New Jersey. Myers was sent to the line after a foul. Also on the line was free Pizza Hut pizza for the fans. <laughs> if the Bulls win and score 120 points, Myers made only one of two, leaving the faithful going home hungry. <laughs> Myers said that he thought that people were applauding MJ. It was actually people yelling at him that free pizza was coming if he hit both foul shots. <laughs> That's fantastic. I love those sort of promotions where, unfortunately, the crowd get ripped, but... Yeah, sometimes it's just uh, the way it plays out. They missed out by one point, eh? Oh, well, Pete. Rolando Blackman, great friend of the show, episode 70. Hit for a would-be season high of 41 points at New York, steering Dallas to an impressive 108-103 to win over the improving Knicks, who had their six-game home win streak snapped, even with 32 points from Patrick Ewing. Rolando's career high is 46 points, which he recorded versus Sacramento the season prior. Commissioner David Stern announced that Houston's Mitchell Wiggins and Lewis Lloyd would be banned from the NBA for drug use on this date. Now, we're referring to the 13th of January here. This less than 12 months on from another rocket, John Lucas, and his being waived by the team due to similar circumstances. Lloyd returned to the NBA for his final season in 1990. Wiggins resumed his NBA career in the 1990 season before retiring in 1992. And on 14th of January, the LA Clippers finally returned to the winner's column with a 123-105 to home win against Denver. Michael Cage had 22 points and 10 rebounds, whilst Mike Woodson added 20 points. This was the team's first win since December 10, 1986. It was just the second victory, they were 5-31, and in the franchise's last 30 games. So absolutely brutal. For the Nuggets, Alex English played a lone hand with 39 points. Moving on to Players of the Week, January 4, Larry Bird of Boston averaged 30.3 points, 9 rebounds and 7 assists a game as the Celtics went 3-0. and On January 11, Isaiah Thomas of Detroit had averages of 24.7 points, 14 assists and 2.7 steals per game as the Pistons went 3-0. and And our individual highs for this period of time, mate, 4 points. We had equal leaders, Michael Jordan of Chicago and Dominic Wilkins of Atlanta. They both dialed up 53 points. MJ on the 8th of January versus Portland. And as you mentioned, Neek on the 12th of January versus the LA Clippers, one of his future teams. In the rebounding category, Robert the Chief Parish of Boston had 25 boards versus Sacramento on the 9th of January. And John Stockton of Utah had 22 assists versus the Lakers on January the 8th. Now, quickly rounding out the NBA standings through January 14th, our division leaders were in the Atlantic, Boston were 25 and 10. In the Central, Atlanta were 24 and 10. And in the Midwest, Dallas were 23 and 13. And in the Pacific, the league leading LA Lakers were 27 and 8. Chicago were 18 and 15 at this stage. They went 4 and 1 during this span. And the lowly LA Clippers were just 5 and 31. So, mate, that rounds out episode 6 of NB87. Thanks again for being a part of the show. Anything you'd like to add, mate, before we do finish off this episode? Heron's great sign off to this episode had to be removed. In turn, our blooper reel is also missing in action. A newspaper reported fact was actually an error. Adam corrected this in post-production. My robo-senses tell me that if I know Aaron, he would probably allow me to say, giddy up. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show and share my web address with your friends and colleagues in allairness.com. Check out the podcast archive for plenty more episodes with high-profile guests. Follow me on Twitter at InAllAnnis. Please add your like to the show's social hub, facebook.com slash InAllAnnis. Join me next time for another edition of the show.